I'm certainly not anyone's first choice to be explaining the complexities of Lacan Seminar 9 on identification, and not even qualified to discuss the smaller chunk of topologies presented in Lesson 17, which took place on April 11, 1962. Given my limitations, I wanted to do two things. First, to think about that day in particular as a real event in Paris, at the height of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis would take place in October. Second, given that I am not up to the content of Lesson 17, to think about Lacan's style, what he himself called Lexis, the word in contrast to Fasis, the sentence. Dan Collins, who can talk about Fasis much better than I, also says that in Lacanian psychoanalysis, we have two forms of criticism a criticism by the cut, and a criticism by punctuation. I conveniently line these up with Lexis and Fasis in hopes of showing you how Lacan's style comes to bear in Lesson 17, and how style, for both Lacan and his perplexed readers, can amount to a means of thinking about the unthinkable. As for style... Lacan was full of it, which many of his contemporaries took to mean he was also full of himself, another way of seeing the title of the seminar as a way of answering the question of how Lacan knew he was Lacan when he got up in the morning. First he looked at the book on the night table and thought about the coming day's schedule, but if this didn't work, he looked in the closet where he could find the right shirt, jacket, and bow tie. If you couldn't recognize Lacan coming across the Pont des Arts connecting the Louvre to the Académie Française or further up to the Sorbonne, you would know him if you heard him. The style that made him famous in the seminars was theatrical, according to all sources. He could cajole, scold, amuse, and confuse all within a minute of stage time, which for some seemed much longer. A part of Lacan's performance art was the learned digression, which demonstrated that there was no piece of history, literature, or art safe from his ability to appropriate for purposes that were not always immediately clear. So in Lesson 17, Lacan begins with stories of Kierkegaard's young girl, possibly modeled after his own beloved Regina Olson. Then the 18th century mathematician Leonard Euler, and his correspondence with Princess Federica Charlotta of Anhalt-Dessau, a part of present-day Saxony. This was to talk about Euler circles, among other things. Euler circles look like Venn diagrams, with the distinction that a Venn diagram can do anything that can be done in symbolic logic, while an Euler circle can show only relevant real-world relationships. Having just recently looked at Jacques Alain Muller's famous, if ascetic, essay on suture, there is such anxiety over the legitimacy of using Boolean logic to talk about the psychoanalytical subject. The only thing I am confident about is that I will never be confident in any discussion of set theory. I once thought I knew something about George Spencer Brown's logic of form, which Ellie Raglan had related to Lacan's thinking but now I think I was wrong on that score as well. I have attempted some independent study of projective geometry, but that's like, as Freud said, the violinist who practices at home without the orchestra. I have had to use substitutes and workarounds. Fortunately, I believe that Slavoj Žižek is even more math-averse than me, so I gratefully use the terms he suggests to summarize the entire idea of projective space self-intersection, and non-orientation. Although these are difficult to explain in Boolean logic, they are easy to see when animated, particularly by Jos Lays, as I'm showing here. The connection to Euler is this. When Euler rings say something is impossible, this is a tip-off that we are in a projective condition of non-orientation and self-intersection, something which is a main course feature in Lacanian psychoanalysis, and also architecture, 
since it is the real of the void. In talking about Mobius bands, toruses, cross caps, and Klein bottles, we are in the land of the subject, which must employ the void as well as the oje petita, the traumatic real, chirality, and negation at every turn. Without self-intersection and non-orientation, you could not have a human subject. And it seems that everything funny or spooky or uncanny or even beautiful in the human world employs some part of this transformative folding. What Lacan helps us to see in Seminar 9 and Session 17 is that ordinary space that seems so easy to explain through Euclid, the circle and the disk, have inner properties that we cannot see, a virtuality that is not like the virtuality of perspective or flat looking. This virtuality connects itself to itself. It presents twists and folds that correspond to the subject's twists and folds. We are origami beings in our relation to our unconscious, something that seems to be on the endangered species list in the politics of national health programs. It seems imperative at this point to seize this treasure of Lacanian lore in whatever way we can, even when, as in my case, we lack the mathematical talent to know it perfectly. When Carl Jung reverted to a project of constructing intersections that were unions, which he called archetypes, Freud and Ferenczi were left without an in-house ethnographer. But with Lacan came compensation on two fronts. First, Lacan himself had a keen eye, not just for finding topography in such things as the Baroque, classical literature, or art such as Las Meninas and the Ambassadors, but also structuralist cases of non-orientation and intersection that cropped up in Levi Strauss's Pensée Sauvage. And also later in the Ljubljana school, Gijic Bladendoller and Olenka Zupancic more than filled in the blanks of popular culture, films, fiction, and even opera. I agree with Mladen Dollar that the idea of anamorphosis can and should be extended to the entirety of Lacan's work, but I would add that we have to revise our view from the restricted sense it gets in the 16th century. I have the same feeling about Muller's argument that extremity might well make the same territorial claim, and with the same reservation. To allow these tides to flow over Lacanian terrain, they need to be desalinated. For example, anamorphosis needs to be related to the uncanny, which was the form anamorphosis took before 1500. And extremity needs to be understood through the idea of a secondary virtuality of effectiveness, which is both self-intersecting and non-orienting. Lacan himself was attracted to this conjunction of the formless and overdetermination. In the case of Poe, Lacan met his match. Not only was Poe capable of overdetermining his poems and stories, as the Poe researcher Richard Copley, who demonstrated Poe's use of chiasmus to match the butterflied halves of the purloined letter, claimed. Poe was a born cryptographer who could decipher a message coded with letter replacement by simply looking at it. Poe himself introduced the idea of chirality when he inserted a reference to the game of mora, or lefts and rights, in the purloined letter. And Lacan was quick to extend this reference to a theory of an automaton, explaining how the big other could remember everything, but also develop rules and regulations, seemingly out of nowhere. Bruce Fink has simplified Lacan's account, which for years had been left out of the abridged edition of the Acree, with a demonstration of adjacencies that resembled the experiments of the mathematician Stephen Wolfram. Wolfram would impose arbitrary adjacency rules and run the computers at full tilt. Before long, the confused patterns would organize themselves, not just into patterns, but into fractal designs. This goes from chaos to overdetermination, 
an arc that can be found first in the practices of divination in the first cultures. We cannot dismiss these as superstitious animism involving barbaric sacrifice. The conjunction of the formless to a superorder, which appeared to the early humans as an undeniable divine consciousness, is not a relic of the past, but something we find in the operations of the present-day unconscious. The numerical demonstration Lacan added to his essay on the purloined letter should not be isolated. In several places, in particular Seminar 17, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis, Lacan attaches the theme of inversion or extremity to that of an anamorphosis that could be seen internally, even in the relations in a sequence of numbers. In the Fibonacci series, which you see here, Something like the random heads-tails exercise seems to reveal an inner capability for emergence. Each new number is the sum of the previous two, and as arbitrary as this may seem, what emerges is a ratio of a form that never changes. Again, the numbers relate to each other laterally, in ways that seem to remember but also prescribe. In that same seminar, Lacan shows how the number sequence plays against itself by splitting into a numerator and denominator that slide slightly past each other to show successively more accurate estimates of the numeric ratio phi. Many are puzzled by the way Lacan relates this numerical determinism to the unary trait. What we have in the number series is a recirculation of what has happened into what is going to happen. In mathematics, this is called idempotency, taken from the idea of a button or switch that, once activated, stays in that state. You push an elevator button, for example, and that's that. Pushing it again won't make it come any faster. When the elevator arrives, the circuit resets. Idempotency is also present in the dream, where external disturbances are neutralized by incorporating the first sensation of intrusion into an element of the dream, as in the famous case of Alfred Maury, who dreamed he had been executed by the guillotine, but it was really the bed frame that had fallen on his neck. Idempotency exchanges figure for ground, ground for figure. In this binomial expression, we see that once the identity of x as x is rejected, the idempotency value is transferred from, so to speak, the effect side to the cause side. At the same time it does this, it necessitates but also internalizes repetition, meaning that this function must be present in the other name for repetition, which is demand. In contrast to the unity which we might say characterized Jung's archetypes, we have the Freudian idea of the remainder that seems to be immune to time and place, the unary trait that is identified at some moment in the past and appears as if for the first time in a present that retroactively connects to that past. Lacan's mathematical genius was to connect the unary trait to the second degree equation related to the Fibonacci series and compare it to the problem of identity, namely that x doesn't quite equal itself because, as a signifier, the signifier can't refer to itself. Reference the big S over little s, as Lacan revises Saussure, means that the recirculation of the effect into the cause suggests a way to put an end to the compulsive search for new meanings. When the geometric shapes associated with this binomial are shown in the classic golden rectangle, we see square after square added without changing the ratio of the sides. This is a 2D shape definition of idempotency. The idea of a remainder both inside and outside the system allows us to assert, at the same time, a connection with extremity, an identity or link from the outside to the inside.
This gives us an alternative and some kind of backdoor access to Lacan's idea of the poisson, the triangular lozenge that is simultaneously a cut or punch and a sign of inside-outness. When he uses this to relate the subject to the Auger Petit A in the math theme for fantasy, we could possibly understand this in terms of the buffer function of it impotency. Fantasy is what buffers the symbolic subject from the real. It impotency self-intersection, to keep the repetition function going, must be non-orientable. In the familiar example of the Mobius band, this is easy to draw, but experience can't quite take it in. Because we physically have to cut the band and twist the ends as we tape them together, we forget that there is really only one surface and one edge. We have to employ some version of the pinch test to repeat the astonishment we always feel when what is so evidently held between our two fingers is really one edge that is twisting to meet each finger, 180 degrees out of sync, so to speak. But if our fingers are pinching simultaneously, how could this 180 degrees, or would it be 360 degrees, be separating this two-fingered sense experience? Lacan argues that this is not a problem in projective space. It's only a problem with projective forms that are immersed into the 3D of Euclidean normal experience. Paradoxically, non-Euclidean space is not an extra dimension added to Euclid's 3, but a subtraction. It's a topology of surfaces, not perspectival projectivity. The twist we think we see is not at any specific point on the Mobius band, although we imagine it to be made at the point of the join. To understand projective space as a virtuality, we can't allow ourselves to associate it with the Euclidean 3D. Here, in session 17, Lacan introduces us to the Euler circle, which looks like the Venn circle so much that when we see the Euler circles come together, it's hard to see why they are not a Venn diagram. The difference generally is that Venn diagrams can show anything that happens in set theory. Take any syllogism or set theoretic proposition in Boolean set theory. You can diagram it with a Venn diagram. The Euler circle, however, limits itself to everyday possibilities, so to speak. Lacan focuses on the overlap, which he says is symmetrical, but different. This happens when you have a union minus the intersection. The caterer arrives, the guest arrives, but the party doesn't happen. The overlap inserts the function of symmetry. The difference adds non-orientation. Something is created, but that something insists on its nothing. It restricts our dealings with it to the periphery, which acts like one curving road that sees its mirror image across a reflective lake. The difference is that the mirror reverses both image and direction. As you approach the southern end, your mirror image scoots off to the north. This is how the shape we know from art history as the Vesica Pisces maintains the interior void as a void, thanks to a double negation that converts Dr. Jekyll into his Mr. Hyde on the fly. As soon as Dr. Jekyll goes in to help a patient, Mr. Hyde is on his way out to a murder. We experience this every day in the form of the all-too-true experience of no good deed goes unpunished. This is probably what Oedipus thought when he seemed to win the contest with a puzzle put to him by the Sphinx. The Sphinx, by the way, is created out of two Euler circles, a bird circle and a woman circle. The Venn diagram wouldn't notice anything unusual, but Euler would alert us to the fact that we're dealing with a monster, logically possible, but experientially falling into the territory of the real 
that we can only deal with through myth. Dan Collins will be presenting a full account of why the Taurus is so central to Seminar 9, so I won't say more on this except to mention that this shape, which seems anything but a standard 3D presence, can be topologized by the pinch test I used on the Mobius band. The trick in applying to this bagel or bicycle tire is to remember the lozenge mirror effect. You think your fingers are moving in unison, but the surface beneath them is moving in opposite directions. You're making a kind of vesica Pisces in sculptural form. James Joyce and the Virgin Mary would be proud of you. Just as the twist is unlocatable and potent throughout the length of the Mobius band, the torus's redefinition by the cut which we can consider as a kind of geometric critique, is it impotent. There is no part where the twist is happening to a greater or lesser degree. Any cut is simultaneously in the middle of the form and the defining edge of the form, cutting into the form. Hence my interest in a term, catagraphene. Lacan in several places talks about dealing with surfaces, and it's tempting to think that paper, being flat, allows only Euclidean kinds of marks. We can't make little origami animals without deforming the paper. In contrast, when we write, we make a necessary distinction between the figures we make and the ground that must stay put and lie flat. Now imagine a devious cryptographer who constructs a code that requires origami folds. We would have to say that the space of signification required us to cut into the medium rather than allow it to lie flat. This is the only way I know to draw a distinction between the writing that is on top of the paper and a writing that deforms the paper in order to make sense out of nonsense. Let me use the standard Greek word graphene, meaning generally to draw, and set it next to a comparatively rare word, catagraphene, which has the sense of writing into a medium, almost like an engraving or words chiseled into wood or stone. Painters always have something interesting to say, so to know more about catagraphene, I thought to look first at Bruegel's Christ and the Woman Taken in Adultery, painted around 1600. But to introduce this image, we should take a look at what it means to write. Bruegel depicts a scene from the New Testament where the word catagraphene is actually used, the only time in the Bible this happens, but in a precise Lacanian sense. Jesus kneels to scribble on the ground in a way that magically resolves a crisis. The Pharisees inexplicably leave the accused woman and Jesus alone when just before they were ready to stone her to death. If we had more time, we could lay out exactly how the unary trait and idempotency work together in this inscription, not just on the floor, but into the floor. Giotto makes heaven to appear to be made with an additional dimension, reversed from what we say about 2D topology as the basis of a second kind of virtuality of effectiveness. This principle of idempotency, interestingly, argues that there is no difference between an added and a subtracted dimension. From the standpoint of enclosure, we have to imagine a smaller dimensionality that can be contained only by a larger. But in topology, smaller and larger, less than and greater than, cannot be distinguished. This is the extomy of both idempotency and the unary trait. Reality can contain the dream or be contained by the dream, like the man who dreamed he was a butterfly but thought he might as easily be a butterfly dreaming he was a man. In the Arena Chapel in Padova, Giotto's mural of the apocalypse shows an angel who treats 3D Euclidean reality as if it were a sheet of paper that could be rolled up at the end of time. The angel is at an angle, 
the messenger associates with the architectural spandrel, the leftover triangular space between an arch and lintel. In topology, heaven is created by subtracting a dimension. In theology, a dimension is added. The principle of idempotency, interestingly, argues that there is no difference. Just as the catagraphic mark can be seen either to add or subtract a dimension in its medium, it is angelic, a message tagged as divine, as angels always are. The mark wears a thin spot in the medium that the Japanese novelist Murakami would say becomes a place where the two worlds come into contact. The edges are marked with ritual circling and palindromic formulas to mimic the shape of the vesica and its void. This famous angel of the apocalypse helps us see how idempotency, this capacity to insulate and maintain the same, relates to the unary trait. Let me sidestep some difficult issues by noting how the unary trait, as Freud noticed, connected a symptom in the present with a symptom or trait in the distant past. If we could zoom back to the original time of the first appearance of the trait, we would probably not notice anything. But once the trait was established as such, it was independent of the temporal dimension, or also, one could say, of the spatial dimension. Like negation, which Freud noted about dreams, where we often encounter the dead, the standard binaries are neutralized. Life and death, day and night, here and there, none of these make any difference. The unary trait, immune to time, is like the twist of the Mobius band. It is impossible to point to a specific point to say, this is where the twist is. Non-orientation in general is like this. It has no locale. But like the angel in Giotto's painting, we can imagine it in relation to a flattening of space and time. Except in this view, we see that what is really 2D, namely angelic space, treats our 3D space, 4 with time, as if it were 2D. What makes projective space virtually superior to perspectival space is its non-orientation and ability to create self-closure. It does this in a way that means that scale doesn't matter. So when scale and time are out of the picture, so to speak, we have an angelic causality that, from the viewpoint of Euclidean space-time, looks like a trick. When Jesus draws on the ground and suddenly his persecutors leave the room, we connect the drawing style, the catagraphene, with some magical effect where the two spaces, the projective virtuality and the perspectival Euclidean reality, have made contact through a portal of some kind. If you are a Murakami fan, you will know that his novel Kafka on the Shore is about points in reality that wear thin and offer openings of this kind. The science fiction aspect of this is unfortunate, since it makes us think of the kind of fantasy where anything is possible, and it is useful to look at the lengths fiction goes to deal with these impossibilities in a rule-structured way. But literary fantasies detract from the structure of fantasy where we would be dealing with the virtuality of effectiveness in a scientific way, acknowledging things such as the Euler Circle's inability to depict something that doesn't happen every day. Thanks to this failure, we have a way to map the impossible real and the ability to structure a cartography that includes the virtuality of effectiveness without having to debate about what exists and what doesn't exist. Like the square root of minus one, Lacan gives us ways of thematizing these impossibilities. Lacan doesn't discuss this particular event or painting, but he brings up an identical case in Seminar 13, the object of psychoanalysis, the case of the injunction of Popelius, a Roman consul stationed in Egypt who, as Livy tells the story, stops Antiochus IV, the king of Assyria, from invading Egypt 
simply by drawing a circle around him with what was reported to be a magic wand. The word was virga, a stick cut from a vine, used by magicians, or vir, as in werewolf. Lacan never seems to lay things out directly, nor does he ever explain the words he uses for titles and subtitles. It was his style to amble, to gesticulate, to digress, to take up one thing before concluding another. This was his style, his lexus, and it cultivated his agalma. So, like Papilius, he was able to hold his audience, stuck to their seats, paralyze them like the stingray they called Socrates, administer his poisons and his cures while they were under hypnosis. If Lacan is hard to quote, it is because he distributed his ideas across a wide field of text, giving little hints here, little hints there. In his announced design of speaking by halves, the me dear, it was up to the audience to meet him halfway, to break the token tessera into two parts, his and theirs. Whenever it was possible for anyone to think through an idea on their own, this process of mutually assured confusion worked wonders. Each conceiver has his or her own conception. The broken edge of their token matches perfectly with Lacan's half, as if there were no others in the audience. Charles Baudelaire famously said that we should thank God we don't understand each other. Otherwise, we should never be able to agree. Baudelaire seems to have foretold what it would be like to be in one of Lacan's seminar audiences, agreeing without understanding. Because this kind of learning has a name, kenosis, we can associate it with the two parts of the tradition that required first emptying out before a subsequent enthusiasm could take place. If catagraphene had any meaning in the biblical story of the woman accused of adultery, it was not only that Jesus was able to empty the room, he was able to stop the story in its tracks and by scribbling, introduce a blah, blah, blah element that, like the empty space between the two Euler circles, signifies nothing. The lozenge shape around this hole is the circulation of the forced choice, but it's also the wink of the Cretan liar, the act and contents of language, the two ways of doing critiques in psychoanalysis by the cut or punctuation, and the specular components of the mirror stage. With Lacan, you never get the full story, but you always find the missing piece. <laughs>